offers the local development scheme which enables the local community and other interested parties to keep track of the progress of development plan documents and to identify points in the process where they are able to participate. The current statement was published in November 2018 and a temporary COVID-19 amendment was added in October 2020. The, the current local development scheme was published in 2021 and seeks, uh, sets out a work programme up to the end of 2024. It is important to ensure that both documents are kept as up to date as possible, particularly when a new local plan is being prepared. So I'll hand over to Richard to take questions and explain the details of the report. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Richard, do you have anything to, to add at this time, or do you want to...? Uh, no, but I'm happy to take any questions anyone's got. OK, excellent. So, open it up to committee. Any questions on the report? Michelle. Thanks, um, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So. Uh, is it possible to start with the actual um, statement of community involvement rather than the um, local development scheme? Is that okay? So, um, just a couple of things. So, first one, on page three, where we've got our approach to engagement, and it's got wherever we engage with you, we will try to. Uh, the second bullet, no, sorry, the first bullet point, keep things simple says by using plain English um, and explaining any technical terms that we need to use, have we looked at the opportunity to formally sign up to the plain English campaign and actually use their accreditation on things like this? Because we're all aware that people generally, on the whole, and making a slightly sweeping statement, do not necessarily always understand planning. And anything we can do to actually simplify it, and the fact we specifically say use plain English, that was the first thing. Have we looked into that? And if so, if not, could we? That's my first question. Richard. Yeah, um, so uh, not specifically, but uh, obviously there's another stage to go before it gets out to publication. And we've already sort of agreed to run it by the comms team to have a look at it and proofread it and just check for those kind of things. So. That's the sort of thing they'll be having to look for, hopefully. Michelle, are you happy with that? Um, I am. I just wonder whether or not we could potentially recommend to Cabinet that we do. I know there's a cost of about £10,000 to sign up to the Plain English campaign. However, that covers us for kind of pretty much any documentation over a period of time. So that wouldn't necessarily just have to be planning. So I know there is a cost because I do it with what. Well, the company that I work for. So um, it's something that there is a financial cost, but on a, from a benefit, especially if you were looking at wider kind of comms that go out than just planning, it would be a benefit across the authority, personal view. That's one. But if we can look at that, that would be. Okay, well, if we come back to that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's perfect. Uh, can I, can I just add to that? So, um, this isn't the first time something like that's been brought up. I remember it uh, from a few years back as well. What I would say is that is a separate issue from the report. Uh, it's a worthwhile objective, and if the council can fund such a thing, then yes, by all means. Uh, but it distracts from the actual report. So it's a separate consideration. Maybe something that the scrutiny com committee could look at and look as in isolation mm. or as separate from this report. Thank you. Michelle? So, yeah, happy with that. I have got some more questions, if it's yeah. okay to continue. Yeah. Um, so, I'll come back to that kind of our approach to engagement in a minute, but I'll work my way through and then go back up, if that's okay. Um, so, we also say we're on pages three and four about engaging with people who want to be involved in the local plan list. How are we planning on publicising that list to residents? Because I haven't seen anything so far in terms of on social media, etc. Is that something that we can push to actually give people the opportunity to sign up for knowledge about the local plan updates? I know that sort of comes into the next item, yeah. but as we're saying, most updates are only going to go to those people or statutory consultees. Can we 
push that through our comms team. Richard? Uh, yeah, we've got, um, we've got a list that exists from uh, people who've previously expressed an interest, so that will go out and as part of the process for this and all the, the other consultations. Yeah. We'll be working with the comms team to come up with a, uh, you know, an approach to, to, to the way to do it to, to get the widest audience. So, so yeah, it's part of that. Perfect, thank you. Um, page seven. Again, about um, it says about letters and emails, and again, I'm specifically referring to the local plan element of this, where we have major sites. Assuming, depending on what the local plan looks like when it comes out, when we have major sites within the plan, can we actually specifically write out to those individuals that are living near to those sites as part of our consultation process? Main reason being people do not always take notice of a local plan document. I know from speaking to residents and constituencies that it's only when something, i.e. a planning application goes in that people take notice of it. They don't look at local plan documents. So actually writing out to new areas where there may be local uh, major developments. I'm not talking about windfall sites or small sites that we're anticipating. I'm talking the big, prop big property developments or commercial developments actually writing out to those residents as part of the local plan process to say please get involved and actually have a say rather than waiting until a planning application lands on their door. Rich? Uh, yeah I mean it would be a later it'd be a later stage because obviously when we come on to it the issues and options one is quite broad um, and later on when there are when there are more specific proposals and potential allocations to, to be consulted on, then, yeah, that's a separate stage, so it's something we can look at at that point, yeah. Thank you, Richard. If, yeah, if we can make a note of it, at least, the, so we don't know what's going to happen in, in the future, so if we can make notes of the comments, that would be fabulous. Um, then we go on to, and this is the bit that I'm actually really kind of keen, and I'll, if I can, rather than you scrolling down, I'll scroll back up again, um, to that first kind of section that I was talking about. So it actually says on um, the, our approach to engagement is that we will be consistent, so you know what to expect and to ensure fairness for all applicants and residents. If you go down to part C, which is about the planning committee um, specifications, there is a section um, about the, shall we say, the time frames that people are allowed to speak for. And I know it's something that's been a bit of a bugbear of mine for a while. But if you look at it, it says, effectively, two objectors are allowed to speak for a maximum of three minutes each. Two supporters are allowed to talk, to support, to talk for three minutes each including one spot for the agent and applicant. So on the odd occasion that we do get applications that are, shall we say, supported by residents, the community voice is lost, or at least one person's voice is lost, because one has to be, or potentially is reserved for the applicant, the other is for, or agent, the other is for someone to support. Um, so actually, can that potentially be changed to the applicant is effectively there on, to present their application rather than to talk as a local supporter? Um, and then we're also saying that ward members that are the affected wards, and I know as Councillor Doyle will be aware, this was changed a few years ago when there was a housing, or there was a development that was proposed in Stony Delft that um, affected was actually within Hammington and it was changed to go from um, just the ward that was affected, um, within the ward to any wards affected, effectively three or six or nine councillors could talk for a minimum, well a maximum of three minutes each. So, it, as a, so going back to that point about being consistent, could we actually change all of them to a maximum of three objectors? three supporters and effectively then leave the councillors because the likelihood is you're not probably going to get three councillors or six councillors or nine councillors but there is a potential that that's the case and I just think that way we're not forcing the planning committee to sit there for hours 
but ultimately the title of this document is Statement of Community Involvement and we're limiting community involvement by that particular reference, well, that particular angle. So ultimately we're here, we want to hear people's voices, we want to give people the opportunity to come and talk to us. So by increasing it for an extra three or six minutes as a minimum, I don't think necessarily causes any harm either way. And that was my main point on that particular document. Thanks. Richard, any, uh, any thoughts on that or Steve? Um, I'd like to defer on this one to Councillor Ford as chair of the planning committee because it's not really my decision on this one. So I <laughs> 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 don't want to tread on anyone's toes. I'm, I'm open to that, uh, very open to that. Um, uh, uh, proposals, uh, I'd like to see something written down if you could provide that for, for me uh, and then we can continue any further discussions. So you'd be open to a recommendation to, to make that adjustment? Okay. Can I point out that that would probably be under a different discussion to discuss uh, planning committee process. Um, so I got uh, three supporters, three objectors at three minutes each. Yeah. yeah. But that's a challenge to the process for the planning committee. Mm. Okay. I'll just bring Sheree. Thank you, Chair. Whilst I don't disagree with Councillor Cook's thoughts on uh, community involvement and involvement of residents, I'd be loath to limit the involvement of councillors as councillors are specifically asked by residents to go along to present their point of view, particularly residents who don't feel confident speaking in public, don't feel um, that they have the, the necessarily the, the background knowledge or the skills to do that. So uh, whilst I would certainly encourage more involvement from residents, I wouldn't be in favour of anything that decreased the potential for involvement from councillors. Thank you. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks, Sheree. Michelle, do you want to come back on that? Thanks, Sheree. Yeah, just to confirm, I definitely didn't mean that. I meant just increase the amount of time actually available to residents themselves. I'd love to sit here and see this document. We're saying that residents could put video applications in to talk because a lot of people don't want to talk in front of a planning committee or have the time or the ability to come at six o'clock. So actually, yeah, that's my point, of kind of increasing the amount of opportunities for members of the public to actually talk. Yeah. And dare I say it, there might even be an opportunity for major applications because remember that, that, recommend, that section applies to any application, whether or not we're talking about someone objecting potentially to somebody's garage being converted into a, a playroom versus 4,000 houses. It doesn't make a distinction. So even if it was an opportunity to do that, increase it again for major developments, ultimately, as Councillor Ford and planning members will be aware, this just means it's a slightly longer planning meeting. I know that's, slightly it's, I know that's a side issue, but it's... it's I think potentially some of these things could be covered within the constitution and therefore could be an issue for the constitution working group. No, Sorry. I, I would hate to be quoted on this, but from memory, that sort of level of detail isn't covered in the constitution. Okay. But I think it's certainly, we're at stage one here, and I think it's certainly something that could be looked at in preparation for stage two. I, I, would, I would suggest that um, Steve's portfolio order takes, takes this, that particular point, certainly, certainly back at this point. The alternate to that is that we make a recommendation, and I don't think we really need to do that I think it's a matter that can be resolved fairly easily. Yeah. Um, but within conjunction of yeah. the chairman of the committee, I think is the best way to do it. Mm. Richard? Yeah, uh, I'm in agreement. One of the first conversations, it might have been with you, Richard, in one of my first meetings when I took over as a chairman of planning uh, was how much discretion do I have 
in the three minutes bit, and I was, what, what I was informed was it isn't covered by uh, the statement of community involvement. Um, whether that we can make that recommendation on increasing the number of members who can speak, a uh, number of supporters and objectors to speak, um, um, we potentially can. Um, but uh, I do believe it's probably the best place for it is in this within covered in this document rather than mm. the constitution, which as yeah. people mentioned has nowhere near enough uh, this the level of detail uh, that this document provides. Thank, thanks, Richard. Yeah, so I think I think we probably informally got it got it covered. I think if we're all in agreement with that, I think we probably are. Michelle, you want to carry on? Sorry, I know I'm being slightly difficult, but it's one of those things where the assurance, I, th I personally would be much more comfortable with the recommendation okay. that actually that is amended to reflect at least three minutes times three to reflect kind of the same as what councillors, assuming that it's only from one ward that would be talking, uh, not limiting councillor involvement. Um, as part of this, because ultimately this is the document that sets what we're going to do. It's all very well and good saying we'll talk about it afterwards, but that's why we sit here months later going, oh, it can't happen because. So that's my recommendation. I'd love to move that as a. What, what's the wording of your recommendation? Um, increase the maximum objectors and supporters to three for at least three minutes each. So nine minutes, nine minutes, and then assuming that three councillors wish to speak from one ward, which we have three councillors per ward, it's at least nine minutes for available. Um, well, we have, a, we, have a mo we have a motion. Do we have a seconder for that? Ben, thank you. Um, I, I would be more, personally, I would be more comfortable if we, if we, we, we asked Cabinet to consider or the appropriate the appropriate um, committee to consider. Steve, would do you want to just add in? Uh, yeah, I'll be honest, it's after the last presentation I made to the planning committee, which was in the three minute limit, um, and the one that I did before where I had five minutes to speak, there's a great deal of difference when you're trying to speak. Um, I had actually said to Anna, and Richard that I wanted that reviewed and I wanted it back to five minutes. Now, um, I'd have, for me, I think if you, two people given the opportunity to speak, either objectors or uh, supporters, and give them five minutes each, would allow them to express themselves uh, sufficiently. But given what that you proposed, I've got no objections to it. Um, and it's something I kind of agree with. Um, and I would like to do it in conjunction with Richard as head of uh, the planning committee. So I believe uh, it's better to work with people rather than impose. So I haven't got a problem with it. Sure. Um, from the point of view of due process, I would have thought that actually the decision on how a particular committee conducts itself is the responsibility of that committee. So whilst we can make a recommendation, we can't make a decision. No, it's a recommendation, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a complicated one because it, it, it kind of crosses over. Um, I, I think, and I think, I think in some respects, you know, we, we, we have a motion and I'm going to be quite informal about this because I think we're all... We're all adults, and I think we can we can deal with that in in a scrutiny meeting. But I think um, I think there's I think if we do make a formal recommendation. It goes it goes through to cabinet, and then cabinet can in, investigate that as in the appropriate manner. So I think I think that would probably satisfy everybody's sort of concern. So if we if we said we we would ask cabinet to in, inv investigate would you be happy with that Michelle yes I suppose just going back to the original kind of um, recommendation it says that committee endorsed the recommendation for cabinet to resolve to approve the publication of so ultimately 
it's up to, it is up to cabinet to decide whether or not they wish to recommend yeah, 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 yeah. it or not it's just a recommendation that we actually increase the amount of community in, involvement without doing a free for all that's what the alternative is okay thanks we'll we'll come back to the recommendations when everybody's sort of uh, steve you want to say something else now the door's open on this one because yeah. I've already recommended a change and to be honest they're along the same lines of roughly giving 10 minutes uh, in total for somebody to speak uh, whether that's two people or three people that's besides the point but uh, giving opening up that window so that it's slightly larger so people can get across what they say it's an interesting point that you picked up against uh, those that are in support of it uh, I kind of missed that one so I'm thank uh, thankful for that one uh, but yeah, you're pushing against an open door. I'm in favour of something like this, and I'd already highlighted it. Thank you. Okay, so we'll 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 come back to that additional recommendation um, when everybody's had their say, Shireen. Just very briefly, Chair, um, and without wanting to sound like a total radical, if we actually believe in democracy, then actually time limiting the amount of time that people can speak is inappropriate and we don't do that in a court of law we don't say well you've got five minutes and that's it um, now I know that there are difficulties I do apologize I don't quite know why this is playing up as it is does it make any difference yeah okay maybe a bit um, so I think um, we need to consider some form of wording that would permit the chair some discretion uh, because there might be major applications where actually a lot of people want to speak and I think an awful lot of damage is actually caused by having a rigid system whereby people who have genuinely held views don't feel that they've got the opportunity to put those views forward and, and whilst it would be I think inappropriate to allow 15 people to comment on somebody's garage extension it might be totally appropriate to have 30 people who wanted to comment on some major development. So I think we we need some weasel words in there, really, don't we, to give the chair some discretion on that. Thanks, thanks, Sheree. Richard. I am quite comfortable with the wording at the bottom of page 13 of the SCI, uh, the Decision Making Planning Committee. Sorry? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 there may be exceptional circumstances which council people refer to as the major applications um, where the time allowed by public speaking may be uh, extended at the discretion of the committee chair. Uh, I've made it quite clear that uh, I want to be as transparent as possible when I'm in the chair of this committee. Uh, there's two things that, well, whenever the next committee date, because the last two have been cancelled because of no business. Uh, we'll be adding onto the agenda on a recurring thing, one regarding appeals and one regarding uh, officer decision made just for noting so the people who look at the agendas can actually see that we're not doing this all behind the scenes. These are the applications that have been approved with officers without coming to the committee uh, through the scheme of delegation. Uh, I'm quite comfortable with, with that wording, um, but I, I wouldn't be against if someone wants to strengthen it slightly. I guess like being new kind of to this like when I saw like kind of that adjective I kind of wondered would that kind of extraordinary cover kind of the examples that you gave um, Councillor Fook but then I heard the great metaphor free for all but well actually is this kind of next set of stages necessary so that it doesn't become 30 people on one person's garage so in your kind of wider experience is it better that we kind of take these steps with the wording thank you that you've given to ensure that there are still those checks and balances rather than leaving it as is with should there be you know a recommendation for four thousand houses in tamworth then there are more people thank you to whoever wants to answer but th thanks sarah i was i was just looking at maybe we say investigate the opportunity of increasing the time and number of speakers at planning committee now i know that doesn't sort of be as specific as, as Michelle, what you what you suggested, but it does add in that that time um, opportunity, and, I, and I, I'm I'm confident that that Steve and his team, in consult, consultation with with Richard as planning chair, will will really take on board board that. 
Would would everybody be agreement in agreement with that as the wording? Yes, well, I would be. So excellent. Okay, well we'll come, we'll 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 add that in at the end. Um, Michelle, do you have any further questions at this time, or, or shall I open it up to to anybody else? So, not, I haven't got any more on the statement of community involvement itself, but I do have a quick question, and it's more of a point, really. Um, it's one very small addition to ask to be requested to be added. Under the Local Development Scheme, um, page number, or, uh, number six, which is the Joint Working Slash Duty to Cooperate section, and it's just a real kind of small little thing. It mentions about we'd engage with Litchfields and North Warwickshire councils, but it doesn't specifically mention Staffordshire County Council and Warwickshire County Council. Um, and whilst I know neither of them produce local plans, most of our major infrastructure problems are highways or education concerns or doctors or whatever it happens to be. And the fact we're not mentioning the two local highway authorities, which effectively feed into Tamworth by Dan Yashley Road or in from Litchfield, it just seems slightly odd. So could we potentially just add them just for a point if they are really important stakeholders in what we do? Thanks, thanks, Michelle. It's a fair, fair point, I think. Richard? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they're sort of covered by the in brackets or the relevant bodies bit of the paragraph, but we can specifically name them under that section if that would make you more comfortable with that. Yeah, I think I think I think it's reasonable to to name them. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments on this report? No. Okay. So we we have a number of recommendations and an additional one that we've that we've discussed. So recommendation one is that the committee endorse the. Um, the recommendation for cabinet to resolve the, and approve the publication. Well, with, we can't really do that because we've, we've, we're making a, a recommendation for a change. Um, so, the second re recommendation is committee endorse the recommendation for. Um, we can't really do any of these, actually, can we? <laughs> <laughs> we can do three authorities is delegated to the planning policy and delivery team leader to make any minor typographical amendments to the documents before or after publication. Yeah, you're happy to move that, Richard? Are you happy to move number four, which is our additional one, which is investigate the opportunity of increasing the time and number of speakers at planning committee? Excellent. Do we have a seconder for those two, Ben? Thank you. Um, all those in favour, then, of recommendations three and four. Excellent. Thank you. Steve, are you comfortable with the reasons why we've not recommend, made the recommendations one and two? Thank you. Um, excellent. We're on to agenda item eight, which is the local plan issues and options consultation. So this is... This is an effect, and I think I'm correct in saying this is this is us looking at is the is the document okay to go th to um, to consultation. So I'm going to hand back over to, to Steve again. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Goodall. The purpose of this report is to seek the committee's endorsement of the report that details the proposal and recommendations that will be taken before cabinet. <coughs> Excuse me. Primarily, the launch. The launch of an issues and options consultation as part of the development of the new local plan for Tamworth. Progress on a new local plan for Tamworth has now reached a stage where it is intended to run uh, the first of several public consultations to seek input from local residents and other stakeholders. The document in Appendix A has been written by planning officers in consultation with a cross-party working group of councillors and sets out the issues that the new plan will need to address and where appropriate potential options for achieving that. So I'll hand over to Richard to take any questions and explain the details of the report where required. 
Richard, anything to add or do you want to go for comments and questions again? I'll, I'll just add before we start that it is a very rough draft. So again, um, there'll, be, there'll be some changes to it before it, it, there it goes, in fact, before it goes to cabinet, just because of the, the time frames involved, there are some, there, there are some uh, elements in there that are a bit rough on this version, especially formatting. Um, but yeah, that, th so those points aside, it's more about the, the content and the general aims that we're interested in. Thanks, Richard. Questions or comments from committee? Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, this is not meant to sound like a criticism, um, uh, or if it is, it's a constructive one, I hope. We do tend, I think, as a council to be reactive in the way that we try to engage with people so we use existing lists of people who've been in touch with us before or expressed an interest before and it's just really a plea and i'm sure you've got this in hand to try to make sure that we get as much uh, consultation and as much input as possible because i think there are some really important issues with the local plan that um, if residents were aware and, and i'm not saying that you know they I'm not saying that sometimes residents perhaps are less aware than they ought to be, because sometimes they are, but um, I think people would want to, to comment if they could. So I'm sure that you will be taking as many proactive steps as you possibly can to get as many people involved as possible. Th thanks, Sheree. Yeah, I totally, totally support that, and I think probably everybody in the room does, actually. I think, um, I think it's very, very important that we, we gain as much... Um, as wide a range in public um, consultation as we as we can. Um, so yeah, if it, I'm sure you've got that covered and and take that on board. Uh, yeah, I mean I think I mentioned it in response to the the on the previous item as well. But yeah, we'll be we'll be working with the comms team to look at the the best sort of approach to get the widest engagement possible. And I guess I would ask you guys as well when you going about your business if you can you know push it to get people to have a look at it and 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 put any comments in they've got that will be really helpful because the more feedback we get the, the better we can sort of do in the next stages as we go along so yeah yeah Th thanks thanks richard michelle thank you yes i've only got a page and a half of questions on this one so, <laughs> so um i had time earlier to read it so um properly um so yeah so in terms of local plan completely in at the endorse what council people and yourself chair have just said in terms of engagement with people pushing any sort of opportunities so i don't know if it's doing webinars video sessions to actually set up what actually is a local plan because it kind of says it quite neatly in the kind of the introduction section it's just that it's next the next stage and it is just kind of a comment that um, i will will pick up it's only when you get to 6.2 of the document that it specifically says the potential to need to deliver 2,961 houses before 2043. And I think we need to be far more transparent that ultimately a local plan is about, to a certain extent, building homes for people and businesses. This isn't about limiting development in many ways. This is about a minimum number of homes that need to be delivered by our authority to meet our need. And you only have to, dare I say, drive around Hamwood to actually look that we don't have the capacity to build, or very, unless we build on an awful lot more of our green space to deliver nearly 3,000 houses. So that they're gonna have to go somewhere. And I think we need to be far more open to the public by training sessions and opportunities for them to engage to actually say, this is what this is about and this is how so actually don't ignore it until that planning application comes near where you live get involved now because this is your opportunity to influence where you can on actually how is it going to happen it's about what standard do we want them to be and this is the time now not in x year's time to have that conversation so that was my first point yeah um second was on page six me, gosh i think it's page, page six it was just a really interesting thing that under the section of housing, what was housing? Um, yeah, on the average, um, where it says our housing, the average price house price in the borough is £201,607. Um, 
Do we know when that particular figure was put in? Is that recent or not? Because I thought the property prices had done some sort of magical spiral in the last few months, and that seems slightly lower than what we're seeing. So it was just a point, and then just to note where it's got there, in the lowest quartile of salaries, the, the lowest quartile house price is 7.91 times the average salary. Houses in Tamworth are becoming more and more and more unaffordable to the vast majority of the population, and especially the lowest income generators in society. So actually, just is that figure up to date was my first question, and I'll pause there and let that answer. Richard? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, we'll do double check them before it goes out, and I think I'll, if I'll ask, I'll ask him to put the um, just to put a little note on of when that info is from, just so it's clear to people. Because I, I think it's from, I think it's from the quarterly information. So it might be from the end of last year. It might be the sort of early this year info. But I'll, I'll double check and I'll just get it. I'll get it added in as a how recent that info is, to, just to make that clear. Thanks. Yeah, it's just the fact that there's certain things in there that are 2020, and I was thinking kind of, I know that these plans take so long because of the evidence that are required to move things along. So it's just um, moving on then. Apologies if this sounds like a little bit of a bugbear, but... Considering local plans are probably one of the most technical documents in terms of evidence that we have, <laughs> that we operate with. Section five, which is about kind of our vision, um, and it says that effectively the vision is to be used as the starting point for all of the local plan. It's a little bit, I suppose, a little bit nervous that to a certain extent, we're still trying to put the evidence base together towards the local plan and things, and not the local plan, evidence based together for the vision and the fact that things like homelessness, vulnerability, well-being do not mention, are not mentioned within our vision at all. I'm just really, really keen to make sure that those really important things are actually threaded through this document. To a certain extent, they are, but it's just something that, Again, a pushback to officers. Homelessness is a massive issue, or safety surfing certainly is. And when we're looking at some of those figures about the number of people who are in the lowest quartile of economic kind of generation are so far out of their stretch, and that's only going to get worse, we need to be making sure that we're pushing that as an authority. So that's just a technical point. If, if I can just come yeah. back there. I'm I'd say objective three, which is provide a supply of high quality and affordable homes to meet the needs of all sections of our community, probably just overarchingly cover cover that. Uh, it, I'd take it your does. point. I suppose, yeah. I suppose in terms of affordable housing, though, by the sheer nature of the technical term, is 20% lower than market value. So already the market value for many people is well outside of their reach. And that's only going to get worse if property prices continue to grow and incomes and ability and other bills go up, affordability is going to become an issue. That said, the objectives that are in the documents I absolutely fully support and I'm delighted to see that climate change is number one in that and um, looking forward to kind of seeing that go forward um, over the kind of coming months. Um, da -dum -dum -dum. One, um, if I can, and it's just a topic... Um, under 6.13, which is about the achieved 10% biodiversity net gain, one particular thing, and it sort of potentially brings us on, without bringing us on to the next conversation about hedgerows, actually, could we add in here that we will not unnecessarily remove hedgerows or trees from boundaries of our developments? Um, it might make it more difficult, potentially, for developers, but... That's some, I know, I know that'll be in later conversation, yeah. but actually from a local plan perspective, it's a really easy way for us to say, actually, unless there's an absolute reason, i.e. access roads or pedestrian access, don't touch hedgerows, as an example. That's just something that we could add in within the local plan. Uh, but I know once we've voted on this, it kind of moves past, so can't go back. And that was my point of just raising it as an issue. Yeah. 
I've got some other information sort of yeah. for, for the next item that we, we can consider, I think. Yeah. Um, whether, I'm, I'm not sure legally how that would work in, in, in a local plan document. I'd have to defer to, to Richard and I think he might have to defer to somebody actually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it, I think it depends a little bit on exactly what your objective is and how restrictive it is. As Anna always points out, sort of being too overbearing in your policies, they normally get kicked out by inspectors as you go along. So there's a there's a line you can get to in in attempting to achieve those objectives, but at a certain point, being too specific, we'll we'll, we'll see it be kicked out along the process. I'd say let's hold that one for the next item because I think I think we might be able to do we might be able to do something that assists, let's say. That's sure. Can if, I if, just really quickly just add sorry, to say one tiny little thing? Uh, yeah, it was that's what I was yeah, sorry. It was really and, and apologies for cutting across you, but it was really to, to back up the point. Um I appreciate what you're saying about having things thrown out, but sometimes, to, co to coin the old phrase, it's better to seek forgiveness than permission. So, you know, get it in there, and if it is thrown out, well, so be it. But at least we've stated what we believe in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's, it's a, this is a difficult one, really, because I say it goes on to, the, it, it crosses over into this next item, but I don't want to really miss out an opportunity within this agenda item. I'd, I'd like to feel we can perhaps discuss it during the next item and then <laughs> see where that takes us. And I'm sure, I'm sure if there's opportunity, we can perhaps move, move something in in a different way. Richard. So as well, obviously, that when the consultation goes out, it's open to everybody, including you guys. So obviously, if you have a specific thing, because I know some of you have been involved in the working group as we've gone along and what's gone into this document, but if any of the rest of you obviously got thoughts and whatever, then respond to the consultation, put them in at that point, and then we can consider them as we go along. So you know, if you've got an idea now, it doesn't necessarily have to go in at this stage because you can feed it into the consultation and it'll be part of the next, the next stage of the, of the, of the development of the plan, if that makes sense. Eric, it does make sense to me, but do bear in mind that what you put out is effecti effectively setting out our stall. So it will be taken by people out there as what we believe in, what the council believes in. So we do have to be careful that what we put out for consultation is, is what we actually believe in and what we think should go forward. Yeah, so I, I think... <laughs> Let's let's come back to this a, li a little, little bit. I know Sarah, you want to come in, but let, I'd, I'd I'd say we can come back back to it. And there's, there's I don't think there's any reason why if we come to some sort of a particular view during the next item that we can't just say, okay, well we'll just. I'm quite comfortable that we can just throw that back to referring back to this item. So let's let's go with that. I think. Sarah. Um, on the idea of kind of the words of the planning, um, would that kind of consultation be the best? Thank you for doing that. I just assume people can hear me. Would that be the best place when we can explore this wording? Because I agree with my colleague, Councillor People, the idea of these objectives are our vision, and I hope you don't mind me saying we warmly support the wording of, of Councillor Cook looking in particular at housing and the needs of the vulnerable. And as kind of someone new to this, you know, I do kind of have sympathy with the officers who put so much work into this under a political agenda that is seen at borough, council, and national level a society in which now the United Nations is involved in trying to support our most vulnerable thanks to the political policy since 2010. Thus, when we're looking at our objectives here, that idea of objective three, not just a supply, but a full supply to guarantee the housing needs of all sections, is there scope for wording there to make sure that we meet our political objective to support all those in our community? Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Michelle. Sorry, yeah, there's not that many more to go, I promise. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, completely 
quickly on that. And the only thing that I would go back to those, what I was going to say before was about some of the boxes. You couldn't quite see the end of what was being said. So that was why I was going to say I couldn't see if there was more to it in those boxes or not. Um, 6.2, I've already made my points about, can we please make the housing number number a bit higher up in the document? Um, but also, we're then effectively um, ultimately saying within this, as we go into kind of 6.2 onwards, about the fact that we will be effectively relying on duty to cooperate with neighbours um, to build some of these properties. Um, and in one particular um, I think it's 6.2, option 6.2, the question and um, where it's got point number four, look to release land from the green belt to meet housing. Now I'm quite aware the only green belt that we've got in Tamworth is around Hockley and Wilnercote and in um, north side of Trinity Wards or Dost Hill. Um, but does that mean then ultimately we are asking assumptions or potentially asking people to consider to release that green belt or are you looking at our neighbours i.e Litchfield to release their green belt and if so without making a slight political comment in which case why is the deputy leader of our council currently supporting the objections to green belt release on the edge of Hopwas if in our document we are saying that we should be expecting um to release green belt to meet our housing needs and is it anything to do with the fact that he lives in hot pots that thanks michelle we're not going to get down a, no, a political uh, route in a scrutiny committee you, you, i'm sure you appreciate that um Absolutely. i'm sure richard will, will come back with some some information on the on the point about green belt yeah so uh, uh, national policy level green belt is is still sacred and it's there and it's protected and it is the last it is the sort of uh, last option when you've explored all the options and can't find an alternative. So that's, it has to be in there. And I don't know if the, 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 somewhere between when, we, when I put it in there and it's got here, the formatting has gone all over the place. But the, it, does, it does sort of make the point that the, the release of Greenbelt is a last resort after we've explored all the other options. And, it, and it, it, I think it, it says that in the question that, you know, keeping in mind that that's right down the bottom of the list of potential options and, and the government's approach. But if we ask the neighbours and they can't do it without releasing their green belt, then our green belt is in theory meeting our need and they'd be having to release green belt, which is not necessarily an appropriate approach in order to meet our need, if that makes sense. So if they can't fit it in without doing that, then there's a possibility it comes back to ours. But ho hopefully, hopefully the, they, they've got a bit more space than us and we can work something out if we have to but that's a you know that's a long process to to, to, to talk to them about thanks but, richard yeah I, I've, it has to be in there because it is a valid option basically that's the i think the the, the point yeah and i think i think again it's just being transparent with people that it is an option so again I know it's kind of like option four, but it doesn't say, it says these are the options that we propose to ensure we deliver the housing need. It doesn't say in wording, this is in a priority order and this is the resource of last resort. So again, in terms of a member of the public reading this, they wouldn't necessarily assume that it was number four of the absolutely end of the road if nothing else is available. So can we just, in that case, can we tweak the wording to, yeah, add a cut off, okay. I think if I can just come back, I think I think it would be natural for them to be put in a particular to to be put in in an order. I would think I would think that would be a a reasonable a reasonable um, expectation myself. Yeah, I'm just going to open my non my non messed up version of it but it does i think it does say at the bottom of the it says at the bottom of the bit about greenbelt it does say keeping in mind that national policy says this should be a last resort so in which case that answers because <laughs> i couldn't see that so that's kind of um, i made the assumption that that was the full stop at the, the end okay can i move on to my yeah. other couple thank you simon um so, da, 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 da. affordable homes, we asked the question of should it be 
percent, twenty five percent, etc., and um, should ultimately we um, expect kind of infrastructure to be protected, or which infrastructure should we pick over others? I think again, I'd really like to see the evidence about what actually infrastructure. I could sit here and say that I think putting a new major hospital might be the best thing to do. What does the evidence say? And I think is there an opportunity potentially to do that as part of the consultation to actually give people what does the evidence say on what's important and what's not, or at least as part of the next phase. Because from an affordable homes perspective, we all know that if a developer is taking effectively a hit on the amount of profit that they make by developing a site, there's less cash in the bag to build other things. It's acknowledged within the document. So I think potentially a little bit of guidance on that for members and also the public of what what we'd be asking for and what's important and the costs as an example that's just a, another side point richard any thoughts yeah so it's just worth remembering obviously that this first stage is is kind of high level and what we're asking people and that question is it bearing in mind that there isn't an infinite pot to do all the things we might want to do what, what is people's view about what we should prioritise because we, we're not going to be able to do it all. What, what, do, what do people want to see and how do they want to prioritise it? Because they're all, they're all slightly different things and you could make an argument for each one being more important than, than all the others. But, so that's kind of why we're asking the question to everybody to say, what do you want to see? Because you know, we, we will be collecting more evidence along the way. There is some there is some housing evidence and some of the stuff we've already collected will be being published alongside this, but obviously there's a there's a lot of other evidence that still needs to be still needs to be collected. So at the minute it's just a what are, what's people's view? What would they what do they want to prioritise given that there isn't an, an endless pot of money? Michelle? Thank you. And my final comment is to do with six point two point six. Um, and again, I know I'm kind of getting the kind of the optics of wording might not necessarily be, but um, additional policy approaches, and it says we propose these additional policy approaches to meet our objectives relating to new and affordable homes. Number one, no specific provision for permanent residential gypsy and traveller sites to be included because the most recent needs assessment identified no need, but include policies to deal with any applications that are received. I think the residents of um, Amington and Dostal at the moment would absolutely be horrified to hear that apparently there's no need. There is clearly, and I know, and I know there's an awful lot of work that Councillor Summers is doing in terms of, shall we say, working with it, but I think it's something to say. There is clearly a desire for the travelling community to base part of their journey, usually from Northern Ireland into Europe, via Tamworth, and that happens year in, year out. So whilst there might not be a need to, or we might not have a site, we might not have an appropriate site, there is a need to ensure that people don't pick our parks and pick our road sites and our castle grounds to conduct their business because that impacts on day-to-day -day residents and they're perfectly entitled to do so. I have no issue with them coming to Tamworth, that's fine. But as an authority, time and time again, even in times when I was sitting in kind of the cabinet when we were having those conversations, we keep pushing this proverbial can down the road that there is no need for gypsy and traveller sites, and there clearly is. <laughs> so when is someone going to do something about it? And that's my final point. Thank, thanks, Chair. thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, there is a piece of work that's going on. There's a piece of work that's, uh, that I'll... Uh, that You've already started. Yeah. All right, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but thank you for that lovely speech. The thing is, is we already picked up on that when we reviewed the report. It's obviously not been changed since the one we reviewed previously. What that refers to is permanent encampment within the borough. We have no permanent uh, travellers or gypsies that live within the borough, so there's no need for a site for them. The business about uh, tra uh, travellers that migrate is a different kettle of fish. 
that is one that, to be honest, Martin Summers should talk more about because although I was previously involved with it, he's picked it up. Now, the work that's been done there, or was being done up until the point that I was involved with, is that there is a rec recognition that there's an under provision within Staffordshire for migrant traveller camps, right? And this is something that a piece of work is being done which involves uh, the police fire and crime inspector uh, and also all the other boroughs and Staffordshire County Council. That's an ongoing piece of work which is, to be honest, outside of this. This particular bit is because it's not been, should have been changed and hasn't, and it's interpreted as uh, migrant travellers rather than travellers that live within the ward uh, more or less permanently. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that's that's kind of exactly what I was going to uh, say, that there's, um, this is aimed at permanent sites as opposed to travelling sites. So I was, I was going to cover it. However, thank you, thank you for your input. My apologies. I, for I forgot you were in on that conversation when we had the, the working plan. Um, so I think that probably sort of covers on there. I, I've got a couple of people waiting, if Michelle. Um, Sheree, did you have your...? I, I appreciate the explanation, Councillor Doyle, and thank you for that. Please, can we have an assurance that this document will not go out with this current wording? Yeah. Because the, the residents of Bowl Hall, Amington, oh, yes, Doss Hill, uh, Belgrave, I think, was also affected. Uh, Wilnercourt, thank you. Virtually every part of town will not appreciate this wording because they feel that their lives were significantly disrupted by travellers, whether those travellers were permanent residents or migrant residents, it didn't really matter to them. They were people who came and encamped in Tamworth and caused disruption to permanent residents. So I think we have to be very, very careful about the wording that actually goes out. So I would really like that assurance. Thanks, Shireen. Now, just before I bring Steve in, I think I think it's a an absolute valid point, and I think you know that's that's us doing our job as a scrutiny committee, and I'm sure Steve's going to take take this on board and he's going to reassure us. Definitely, I was under the impression it had been done. So, <laughs> having a word with somebody shortly, um, that should have been changed for this committee. Um, as Simon has pointed out, it's something that was picked up at the working plan. Um, and yes, I completely agree with you. It, 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 there's no way that's going out. Sure. Could we then please, as a committee, have the reworded document circulated before it goes out, just so that we've had the chance to look at it? Yeah, no problem with that one. Excellent. Th thanks, Steve. Sarah. Okay. <laughs> Michelle. Thanks. So without wishing to labour the point, um, I think that's really, really, really important that technically this document is already out in the community. If somebody, if somebody, if somebody goes on to yeah. Town of Borough Council's website, this document with its current wording and all of its errors and mistakes are there. And I completely agree that it's a draft version, but when this committee and other committees are asked to review documents, that a couple of the points that I've made tonight what would have been answered if I could have seen the, the previous, the, the next few lines down. So actually, can we please, when we're asked to review documents, make sure that they're at least fully visible? I mean, as, as I say, I literally went through this on the train coming home tonight. It wasn't kind of days home while I was making my notes of what I wanted to ask. If I'd have picked it up earlier, I would have picked up the phone going, can someone send me a latest document? But that's what we're here to do. So it's just polite request yeah. for future documents. Thank you, Chair. I, th I think it's a fair point, and I think, I think Steve, if you can reassure us that uh, that it will be updated on the uh, on the website. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a point we anticipated when we did the, the, the last working group, and I appreciate a couple of you who were on the group weren't there. So I think we did, we did add in the lines to say permanent residential, but obviously it's a, it's a useful it's a useful exercise to have had everybody else read that and still, so we'll, we'll get a paragraph in there explaining the difference bet between the, the different types of provision. And also, again, alongside this, when it goes up, we, the, 
the evidence that it refers to will be made available as well so people can then go look at that and see why it's come to that conclusion effectively because it, it was something given recent events that we anticipated would be an issue so that, that's fine and I would say the the formatting was the, yeah the, it's because it's a it's because it's quite neatly put together that when it's yeah gone from being the word version to being part of the agenda that's got a bit lost along the way but obviously we'll we'll have more control over that when we put the final version out so it, it will be properly readable and have been proofread properly by the comms team as well so thanks thanks richard any further questions or comments from committee sure thank you chair yeah um Taking on board your point earlier about not being political in scrutiny committees, I'm not going to mention, obviously, that successive Conservative governments have decimated the social housing stock to the point where we don't have enough social housing for people in Tamworth. And I'm not going to mention the fact that we need some rent control to make sure that people who rent in the private sector aren't um, put in a position where they can't afford to pay their rent. The, rented, the rental sector, whether it's public sector or private sector, is a really important sector. And I appreciate that the local plan is about, are we going to have more houses built? And the implication is that those are houses for sale. But is there any way that we can put something in our local plan which actually talks about how important the for rent sector is and encourages people who are prepared to build houses for rent rather than build houses for sale because the point that councillor cook made earlier is absolutely spot on there are a huge number of people who live in the borough who are nowhere near being able to afford to buy a house even if it is so-called affordable thank you chair thank you richard any thoughts steve Just the one about not being political, and after 15 years of a Labour government and those points not being in place, we can't mention that either. Um, yeah, that, was, that, that wasn't the, the sort of objective of asking you to make a comment. <laughs> I know, I know, but it's much more for time. Um, the rental sector. So... In terms of the affordable side, we can look at tenure mix for the for the affordable element. In terms of the market side, not quite as easy because it's just market housing. Whether someone buys that and rents it versus buys it and lives in it is sort of outside of our remit. But we can, on the affordable side, look at the tenure mix in terms of rental versus affordable sales and those kind of things. Sure. Appreciate that that might be something that it's difficult to do within the local plan, but I think it's something it's for a bigger picture. It's something that the cabinet really ought to be looking at. How can we ensure that we have sufficient properties, whether for sale or for rent, within the borough for the people who need them? Thanks, Sheree. Michelle. I'm more than happy to go next, but I know Councillor Keeper also indicated oh, in advance to me, so if you want to go first. So I make no worries. Um, yeah, I just I think there's two points I'd like to make to um, the, the 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 issues raised. I think first of all, um, it's very important that we keep this document um, ideology agnostic, and um, we can't keep it politically agnostic because politics, you know, the definition of politics seeps into this. But certainly from an ideology uh, point of view, it has to be agnostic. Um, and the and the second point I'm going to make is, um, do we know? Um, if there is a requirement for the issues raised. Do we have the facts and figures to make those de decisions in here at the moment? I, I, I don't think we do. I haven't seen them. So um, for personally for me, before we try and write a recommendation about adjusting this plan to deliver some form of affordable mm. housing for an issue that may or may not exist. Th thanks, Andy. And I, I, yeah, I don't think we were in a position to... to, to to make that sort of a recommendation. Um, I, I don't know if the evidence base exists. Um, Richard? 
On the housing point, yeah, so we, we have got, and as, as I say again, we'll be making it more obvious for people when this goes out, where the evidence that we have got, it's a little bit out of date now, um, but there was a joint housing needs assessment done with Litchfield in 2019, um, which is out there and obviously we can circulate it to anyone who wants to see it and we're going to get it up in a more visible spot on the website, you know, shortly. Um, for everybody to have a look at and also we're going to be going out to sort of get an update on that because obviously a lot's changed since then uh, you know things things are completely different now and it was obviously going to put a slightly different angle on it but uh, yes there was a big in in that work was done a couple of years ago off the top of my head there was a there was a a, a, a big need identified for affordable housing in there and I think it was in actual fact some a, a, around a hundred percent of need it was effectively saying um, in order to make the overall the overall housing level affordable, you needed quite a lot of affordable housing in general. But I say we've we've got that, and that'll be out for people to have a look at when they look through this. And more than happy to circulate it in advance, you know, because it's out there already. It's just it's just not in a very obvious spot at the minute. I think. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. I know I did say it was my last question, but um, kind of what councillor people said did actually spark something I'd missed to do with affordable housing. Councillor Doyle at the is it Health and Wellbeing Committee, I'm, I, and I know it went to Cabinet the other week, um, I made a request for affordable homes to actually stay as affordable homes. Um, and I know that was a request that kind of went in. So in other words, if an affordable home is sold as an affordable home, the next time that it's sold on by that individual, that it stays as an affordable home, I know it definitely went to Cabinet because it's one of the recommendations that Councillor Maycock put forward. Um, where's that gone and is that something that is possible? I'm, guess, I'm guessing that's, that's a question for outside this, this committee, I would, I would suggest. It probably is, but it was to do with the local plan of whether or not as part of the local plan process we could make the recommendation that an affordable house remains an affordable house for paturity. Mm. So a little bit like what Councillor People was saying about, should we say, social homes being, able, being sold off through the right to buy scheme. Mm. It stops that happening by saying that if I was to buy a property as an affordable home, if Councillor Keith came along and bought it later, I couldn't then put the price up 20% and walk off mm. with a profit. It, what I'm saying example. is if, if that recommendation has already gone through to yeah. Cabinet, it's, it's yeah. not something that... It was just whether or not Councillor Doyle knew if that was possible or not now as we were looking at the local um, plan. Okay. That was what I meant. Okay. Uh, Steve, have you, have you got an update or is an update available? I mean, I'm... Actually, Richard wanted to answer okay. that. Yeah, so uh, it, it depends a little bit on the, the tenure of the affordable home, obviously, because if they're a certain social rented, they, they fall under right to buy, and we can't do anything about that. But in terms of the ones like um, first homes, that's slightly different at the minute, and the affordable market sale ones, it's more possible to include the in perpetuity clauses on those. But yeah, some of them, some of them we don't have any control over because of broader legislation. Happy with that, Michelle, yeah. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, we have two recommendations. One is that committee endorse the recommendation for cabinet to approve the issues and options for public consultation based on the documents set out in Appendix A. And number two is that com committee endorse the recommendation for cabinet and delegate authority to the assistant director of growth and regeneration to make any final topographical and formatting amendments to the documents prior to publication. Pardon? Um, With the appropriate changes that with this the, document yeah. readable. Yeah. Well, Sorry, that's a bit harsh, but you know what I mean. With, with the amendments as discussed. Well, as discussed, yeah. Happy? Yeah, excellent. Um, Richard, you're yeah. moving those, yeah. I think. Second there, Michelle. All those in favour? Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I think, Steve and Richard, are you staying on for the next item, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so item nine is uh, the petition to stop the netting of hedges in Tamworth. So, 
if you recall, we uh, Anna was with us last meeting and gave us some um, some further information, and we we asked some questions with regard to um, conditions that could be perhaps or the potential for conditions to be placed. And I've, I've I have had some 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 information back through through Anna. It would appear, and I'm sure Richard will be able to sort of add in where, where, where necessary, that while we could place conditions, I think it is possible, not been done anywhere else, I don't believe, it, it, it may not be agreed by the, the developer as an, as an, because it's an unreasonable request basically an unreasonable condition i think and i would ask richard to to sort of clarify is that is that pretty much the the view i think i've only been on the periphery of this one but i think i've, yeah. I've seen the legal advice that came back and it was yeah along the lines of um at a certain point it would become unreasonable to put that onto onto the developer they could therefore appeal it if you went yeah. along that route. Um, there was an alternative suggestion. Yeah, I was just, just going to yeah, come, so. come through, through with that. So there is the validation criteria, which is the, the point at which an application is submitted into, into the council, a planning application. I'm sure Michelle is quite familiar with these sort of things. Um, um, and that has been in place since 2017, I think, um, and is is currently it's currently being updated. Yeah, um, and I think there's potential for us to well make some changes there. That well, I've got. I'll, I'll read out a few options, and we can we can have a. A discussion about it so we could uh, the submission by applicants with planning application of a compliance method statement as far as validation for relevant applications and this could cover things such as details of hedges and trees to be removed where netting of hedges and trees is necessarily is necessary ensuring that the hedge and tree removal is completed outside of the nesting season and that a trained ecologist assures the correct netting is fitted in a way that wildlife cannot get through or behind the netting. And arrangements are in place for the checking of netting to ensure wildlife is not trapped. Now, I don't think we can sort of move forward with it, with that exact wording, but I think it gives us some, some options for at the point at which the application is made, we can say, well, you need to do this, or the application is has to be resubmitted. And I think that's the crux of that, Richard. In terms of it, if they've not provided the, the relevant information, yeah, yeah. So, so as long as your as long as your validation criteria is up to date then you can invalidate an application that comes in based on it not being submitted okay. yet. Yeah. So so there's there's an opportunity for us to put um, something in the validation process to, to try and Sheree. Well, you may be able to help me. <laughs> I may be able to help you. Um, I've been having a look at the RSPB's website and they give some really useful guidance. And what they say is whilst netting is not illegal, um, that uh, practice of netting is legal. RSPB would like planners and housing developers to take some important points into consideration. And they then set out those important points. So think about whether it's really necessary to remove hedges and trees. Netting shouldn't be the easy alternative. If the work's absolutely necessary, then you could avoid netting by tree and hedge removal outside nesting season. Uh, should be backed by a commitment to plant new trees and hedges. Developers must work with a trained ecologist to ensure appropriate netting is used. 
not the type that will catch birds. Uh, it's essential that a trained ecologist in, ensures that the netting's fitted correctly, that it's checked once a day. We could, I think, as a council, adopt the RSPB's advice as it stands. Mm. I don't think there'd be anything illegal or, or, or inappropriate in doing that because it's all very sound advice. All we're asking developers to do is to follow what's set out by an appropriate body as best practice. I would, I would say I'd love to see that legal advice because I think the question I asked at the last meeting was uh, could we impose a condition which said that you can't net at certain times of the year, that netting has to be removed at certain times of the year. I'm not sure that that would be unreasonable, but I'd love to see the legal advice that said it was. But in any event, I actually think that we, it might be a way forward to say mm. that as a council we adopt the RSPB's advice and we pass that on to developers. Thanks, Sheree. Yeah, I think... I mean, I'll be, I've been told that the precise wording would need to be consulted with county ecologists and, and, and that sort of thing. But I, 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 my personal view is that we could, we could move forward with a recommendation that um, to, to, to full council that, that suggested that we, um, that the validation process encompassed um, some references to, to trees and hedges for example, this, the, 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 the examples that I've, that I've read out. So uh, while, while not referencing the exact words, I think the, um, you know, the, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's the, I can't think of the words, but it's, it's the, it, you know, we, we're going in the right direction. So rather than, I, I don't know whether we could, we could recommend the RSPBs we, we could, but I would, I would personally be more comfortable that we said that we were, get, we were going to review the, the validation process. Sheree. With respect, Chair, I think you're fudging. I think, <laughs> I think, I think we've, we've, we've got, there's a format here that could be used. It's a respected body. I can't see anything wrong with it. You know, all they're saying is make sure that you've got a trained ecologist who knows what they're doing, who puts the netting on properly and checks it. I can't see why developers would object to that. So, you know. Um, I absolutely see your point. And I know you're trying to be very helpful. Um, but I, I would, I would hate to think that we made a recommendation that that got subsequently rejected because the wording didn't fit in with the didn't we missed something legally and while the RSPB obviously have their own sort of legal eagles um, we we might be missing something and that, that's, that would be where I would come in from. So I, w I wouldn't want us to make a recommendation, go through it, go through at council, and then subsequently we, it, was, it, it was legally incorrect, I guess would be my, my point. You think not? Richard, would you offer any advice? Again, I'll preface with, you know, I'm only on the periphery of this, but... It depends what you're trying to achieve because I think there's there's two slightly different there's two slightly different mechanisms being talked about here. The validation requirement is asking for them to provide information, so mm. it's saying you you could say that you want them to pro provide the information on how they're going to deal with netting if they're going to do it and, and provide all that information. And then if that's part of the application, it wouldn't in theory be covered by the condition saying you need to carry it out in accordance with the details you've submitted. But the condition approach is slightly different, is obviously being more specific and saying you must not do this you, or you must do this at certain times of the year, that kind of thing. So they're two, they are two slightly different processes and it depends a little bit on what you're trying to achieve at the end of it as to what the best approach to take is. Sheree. Thank you for that. If I can ask a technical question. At validation, is it appropriate to say to a potential developer, 
we would like information that shows that you have dealt with this in accordance with industry specific guidance uh, yes that's so most of the items on the on the validation checklist say they need to provide information to demonstrate how they're going to do certain things or what they're going to do so if they yeah, it would be saying, can you show us how you will give us the information to say how you will approach this based on the best practice or whatever that is. That's just, just to sort of clarify, what I was saying is, let's not make up our own best practice. We've got best practice out there, which is put, put forward by a recognised and respected body who know what they're talking about. So all we're asking developers to do is to consider that best practice and show us how they're following it. So thanks Shari. So if we said, um, if we re made a recommendation uh, uh, around the lines of that the validation process is, um, is, is, is changed or, or looked at using RSPB um, guidance in consultation with the county ecologist some something surrounding that kind of may 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 work michelle um, i mean yeah i mean on that specific point yes I, personally i think it would i suppose ultimately are we as a committee saying that where possible that netting should not be used as a starter but it should only be used in exceptional agreed circumstances. So for example, is there a need to net a tree or a hedge? Well, no, ultimately there isn't. If, if, with, if a developer is taking out a tree or a hedgerow, then you may do it for a few days. What well, I think probably without speaking on behalf of the kind of people that signed the petition and Councillor Kingston that organised it, People got really fed up or get really fed up when they see trees and hedges netted for weeks upon ends. If a net went up for a couple of days and then the tree was taken out as a final, let's actually, we know it's clear, let's net it and take it out. I don't think people necessarily have a major issue with that. What people have a major issue with is when it's weeks and weeks and weeks. And then you go around and see if the bird or the whatever has died because it's got trapped into it because... Well, if I got trapped in a net, I'd probably have a bit of a heart attack, especially a bird. I don't know what happens when they fly into windows. So actually, it's what can we do to say actually where absolute last resort, something has to come out. But up until then, we're saying as a council, we don't think trees and hedgerows should be coming out. And that's I know this is a personal view, and it might have me. I know I wasn't at the last committee meeting because I was on holiday, but. From a point of, should we say, we, we sit in our or set in our local plan that climate change is kind of objective one. I know they're not in priority order, but objective one is climate change. We shouldn't be taking out trees and hedgerows. And if we can ask developers to work around them where possible, subject of course to access roads and utilities, etc., coming in and out, there isn't a need to take hedgerows out in most cases, not all, but in most cases. So and again, without taking, if you would indulge me for just a second, Chair, to go back to the um, persimmon development on Coton Lane, members that were um, around for that particular presentation by persimmon would have sat in the full council chamber of Marmion and House, and I don't I think potentially any actually Councillor Doyle and Councillor um, Goodall might have been there at the time, or Councillor Peter, you certainly would have been as well, um, when Persimmon came in and they showed this beautiful image of all of their houses and a lovely um, historic Coast and Lane hedgerow. And the very first thing they did was chop those trees off at the at stump and took them out because it was easier for them to do it. And, and you look now at what's being put back. Yes, a hedgerow is being put back and probably by the time I'm retired, it will be back to some sort of growth where it was before. But there was no need other than that developer's ease of their construction to take that hedgerow out. And actually, that to me is not good enough as a council. And as Councillor Kingston said to me, reminded me actually the other week, I walked out of that planning committee meeting where that development was given the go-ahead, hilariously, in tears. 
And I remember driving all the way down on my hands-free car phone, speaking to my now husband in tears, furious over it. And actually, that's personal kind of history. But it's a point of saying we shouldn't be taking out trees and hedgerows unless absolutely critical. When it's critical, then we do it, as I'd say, as council of people, subject to kind of council agreement that all of those industry standards are looked at as part of that criteria. And then we set it there, ultimately, and say, actually, if you want to come and develop in Tamworth, we want nice green open spaces where we can. Stop it. So I know that was a bit of a rant, but that was my... Th <laughs> thanks, Michelle. My I know defense. Steve wants to come back. Yeah, just a question I'd like to ask the committee. How many developers have you invited in to explain their processes around hedgerows? I'm not being funny, but you speak an awful lot about the RSP... PCB, which I fully support the idea of using their recommendations, but have you asked a developer in to ask them what process that they use? Um, no, is the is the is the answer to that? No, is the answer. But this is a response. This this is a response to a petition that was. Um, I understand that, but it's surely if you're going to discuss it, you want you've heard the emotive side where uh, about the birds and everything and that which I get um, but there's also the developers and they might actually agree with you and have a process in place and it might be that they're say for instance Red Row or something like that they've got a documented process that is pretty close to what you're on about well I'm going to open the floor to committee members because I can see a, a number of hands Sheree they may well they, they may well um Stephen, they might they may well have a process and if they do congratulations to them and i'm delighted that they have but that's not really the point what we're what we're doing as a council is responding to a petition that was put forward by residents if we as a council say that this is a matter of concern and it's certainly a matter of concern to me um, and it probably is to other councillors and also to other residents, then there's absolutely no harm in us saying to developers, we're concerned, can you alleviate our concerns? If they have a process in place that would alleviate our concerns, and this really is the concern of the planning committee and not actually of this committee, if the developer has a process in place that would alleviate any concerns of the planning committee, no problem at all, that's fine. If they don't have a process in place, then what we're saying is, well, perhaps you should think about a process. Perhaps you should consider this issue, which is an important issue for a lot of people. I think, I can't remember exactly how many people signed that petition. 4,000. 4,600. So at least, at least 4,600 residents of Tamworth consider that this is an important um, issue. So absolutely agree with you developers might well have a process and if they do that's great and if they don't then we can legitimately as a council ask them why they don't have a process and would they consider putting one in place Thank, thanks Sheree. yeah I, 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 I agree michelle thanks i think just kind of pick up on what you've just said there councillor doyle the planning committee will sometimes or the developers themselves will offer to come and talk to members when there is a development that is proposed. I think whilst we could potentially invite an, a number of developers to come in to talk to us, I honestly don't think if we invited in, let's say, Red Row and Persimmon to come and talk, what about the other hundreds of developers setting an industry standard <laughs> or a nationally recognised body, i.e. the RSPB, who work across all areas of wildlife in terms of birds, at least, which is the main primary focus of what this petition that we've been asked to comment on, gives some sort of credibility. But then when a developer comes to us as an authority to say, we would like to build in your area, that is the point then that the planning department and kind of your officers are in a position to say hold them to account 
and say, yes, hypothetically, we might want you to come and develop in our area because we need, we clearly, as the last item said, got a requirement to build houses in our area. But actually, what standard do we want to hold them to? And what, what is legal versus what is not? Now, we can't ask them to do certain things because, well, that's not within our gift to ask them to do, or it's certainly not within us as Tamworth Borough Council to do, so it might be for the County Council or others. But also, it means in certain situations, it's not financially viable to do so. And that is, again, we're not going to get properties built and if we're in a position that we're making it affordable. So it's, it's kind of a little bit, I find it slightly perplexing to ask that in the way that it was asked, just from a point of saying, ultimately, it's what's here in front of us, not other areas. Sorry. Thanks, thanks Michelle. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the thing that I'm looking at at the moment is what is the strategy for TBC regarding this? And if you put planning application to the planning committee, do they follow that criteria? Yes or no? And if they don't, what is the consequence? Now, you're right to say that RSPB or whoever may be the expert on this, but we must have a strategy and we must have guidance and we must have a, a policy and a document to say, right. And the other thing that worries me, does every planning application go to committee? Because if it doesn't go to committee, then how do we know whether or not they're going to follow that guidance or not? If it's passed by the officers, are they saying you've got to tick all the boxes and follow this procedure? That's all I'd say. I just think maybe we need to check it all out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would suggest that... Um any development that was having hedges and trees removed would be a larger development over 12 houses and would go through committee as as, as a standard process. Um, Richard will be able to, either Richard probably would be able to answer that. Yeah. I'll, uh, I, I mean, I'll come in there just to answer the point about the difference between decisions made at officer level and decisions made at committee level. They are all decisions made by the council. It's just that it's a delegated to officer level on, on minor ones, but the the approach is the same. The, the development should be assessed against the policies in place both locally and nationally and any other relevant criteria to come to an appropriate decision. So if it's an appropriate response to do something to do with the hedgerows, then it will be done whether it, the decision's made at officer level or whether it's made by committee, that's the, they're the, they're the same, it's the same yeah. approach. Thank you. I think Michelle was, was pass. Sherry. I think the, the point that Councillor Turner makes is a really important one. We're talking about policy, but what we're trying to do here is to make a recommendation about the way our policy should go. And um, all I would say, a plea to all of you, is... Let's be forward thinking, let's be groundbreaking even. Wouldn't it be nice if Tamworth Borough Council was the sort of council that, that really took things forward, that picked up an agenda item and actually ran with it and said, you know, I think this is an issue that concerns people, so let's do something about it. Not, I think this is an issue that concerns people, so, well, uh, well we, we won't do anything, you know? <laughs> We're supposed to be responding to our residents. So let's respond to our residents. Let's respond to at least these 4,600 people who felt strongly enough about it to sign a petition and do something. Thank you, Chair. Excellent point. Um, and we have got, the, 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 I say the current validation criteria is under review and the consultation period is until the 20th September. So we've got an excellent op opportunity to to do something at the moment. I have a, the words of a recommendation, I think, here now. I know John wants to make a, a point. Just very briefly, Chair, um, I just really want to uh, back up Cherie and both Michelle in their points on this. The petition was involving Coton Lane. Um, the removal of that hedgerow was, in my opinion, a disaster an ecological disaster for that area of the town. And it was an unnecessary disaster because the hedgerow was taken out um, and a few tweaks put in its place. It was over 100 years old. You cannot replace that in our lifetimes. 
um, and it was a hugely important piece of the local environment. Um, I don't know what the process uh, went, uh, for its removal uh, was uh, undertaken or how that decision to allow it was taken, but I think we must learn some very serious lessons from this because our hedgerows are incredibly important and developers must be made aware that wherever possible they must be retained and not disposed of as the huge the huge length of the Coton Lane um, hedgerow uh, has been lost to us forever and in my view unnecessarily so I would have liked to know for the uh, from the developer, the reason they had to take it out, other than to see their their houses. But uh, we need to learn some very serious lessons from the mistakes that were made in Coton Green, and that has upset all these people who signed the petition. Th thanks, John. Uh, I've, I have got the petition in front of me, and it, 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 that, that got presented to to full council. And it, uh, to be fair, it doesn't mention Coton Coton Lane, whilst we probably understand that was probably where it was aimed at it doesn't because i think we need to have it as it covers the whole the whole town so I'd, i would not like us to be specific on that um michelle did you want to just make a comment i i would just wanted to sort of read my recommendation yeah, I, and I, see was what just, we think. I was just going to say in terms of kind of the reason just to kind of answer because i know and council i was talking about kind of the the persimmon development which is completely kind of at the far end that was taken out and we were told at the time when we were sitting in that planning committee meeting there was no grounds to stop it because it wasn't with any of our policies and this is an opportunity to put it mm. in one of our policies that we're saying no mm. i know this is looking at specifically netting but it's that was the reason then and that's ultimately what it is but um councillor goodall your motion <laughs> thanks michelle yeah, so I was I was just going to sort of offer a, a recommendation that we recommend to full council that the planning validation um, is reviewed and, and reference reference to include the RSPB guidance on hedges and netting in consultation with the county ecologist. Some things it might need a little bit of tweaking, but I think I think that kind of gives us something i think that we could that we could carry forward um so i'm i'm going to move that we that we make that recommendation and you're seconding sheree or are you commenting i'm seconding thank you chair excellent thank, thank you very much um all those in really quick I, I don't know if it's about the motion but just to say the recommendation of the report just one thing it does actually say the report is endorsed and forms part of the ISAG response to cabinet later in the year but item four of the recommendation to send it to here is to council so can we it's get going to council, to council? So that's the fine petition, to check that. the petition was was made to to uh, to full council this will go to full council so so we've moved it's been seconded all those in favor excellent thank thank you Thank you very much. Um, Steve, um, Richard, you're welcome to stay for the rest of our, rest of our uh, agenda, um, or you can, you, or you can welcome to leave. I think I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I blame you really. I'll leave as well. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attendance. Um, next item on our agenda is forward plan. Um, quickly open that up. I assume everybody's had a chance to, to review it. Is there uh, anything on there that members feel should come to committee that's not already on our uh, work plan? I don't believe there is. 
so I guess uh, I guess we'll move on to our next agenda item, which I think is work plan, isn't it? Yeah. Is our work plan? Uh, working groups, working groups. Yes, um, we have a couple of open working groups. Um, ben. I'm going to ask you to comment on the HGV working group. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I regret to inform you that we've not managed to meet yet. Um, there was uh, some timing clashes with Michelle and Sarah, um, and also I I've had a few things going on, um, but I will endeavour to make sure that we meet before the next meeting. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the other working group... Uh, or, or is travellers now we I was waiting to find out some more information I mean we've had a brief sort of touched on this discussion earlier um, I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion to committee um, I know um, Councillor Maycock um, has, has done a little bit of work on um, on this item and I think has been in, consulted with, with the rest of Health and Wellbeing um, Committee. As our agenda or work plan is quite full, I'm going to make a suggestion that I meet with, with Councillor Claymore, Chair of Health and Wellbeing and, and, and Councillor Maycock and, and maybe see if we can Rather than duplicate work, we can we can perhaps come to some sort of agreement of who takes this on board. And I'd rather like it to be health and wellbeing, <laughs> um, as they've already done some some a little some some background already, and our work work plan appears to be quite full. Um, Sheree, you want to make a comment? Just don't let it fall between the cracks, Chair, because don't let it fall between the cracks in the sense that we know that this is a very live and very important issue. And um, I've had several residents in Bowl Hall saying, well, we're OK for three months, but the three months is nearly up. So, you know. Absolutely. Um, while the, the Chair and Vice Chair may not know yet... I have actually scheduled a meeting with them tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. So they may not have picked that up yet. Um, and and hopefully we, we can we can reach some some, some agreement over that. But um, the, this is in no way um, me or this committee trying to um, not not do this work. I just feel that it's if it's been started on another committee then then maybe that would be a better a better way of uh, of moving forward with it, Michelle. Thanks. I mean, it's great. To, I'm, I'm happy with that as an option. I think the only thing, just based on our previous conversation and uh, kind of where we're talking about traveller communities, can we amend the language, even if it is staying on our work plan, even if it switches to health and wellbeing, actually change the um, stakeholders relating to migrant travelling communities? <laughs> Not permanent, just so that we don't make that. Yeah, yeah. Because I think that's the that's the bigger issue. It's quite clear that yeah. the permanent stuff is going to be picked up or not through the local plan. But I think, this is about migrant. I, th I think I think that's fair, but I th it, it it possibly forms part of a of a bigger thing. But I absolutely see your point. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. We'll, so we'll move on to item twelve, which is the committee work plan um, we've got for our next meeting we've got a couple of couple of large items um, and if if maybe one of those items doesn't sort of isn't quite ready I might I might want to try and adjust just the timing of the meeting and I hope everybody would agree that that would be the right thing to do um, We've, we've got a rather large report coming on the net zero baseline reporting, and I think that's that, I think that is a really interesting um, piece of work. So, if you recall, that'll be like um, 
where we are now with our assets from a, um, a net zero point of view and then how we can move forward from that point. Um, and we've also got a future high street fund update. So that is our next our next meeting that's currently scheduled middle of middle of September. Um, and then just sort of highlighting a couple of other items on future meetings. We've got um, an update on the dual stream recycling, um, more future high street fund. Um, we've got council house repairs policy that we we should be looking at, um, fire safety updates. So that's just a little bit of a taster of what we've got. I'm sure that you're all aware. Um, so is there any other... Uh, John. Hi, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, at a meeting last night uh, that you were president, we discussed basically uh, a couple of inf infrastructure issues, which um, I'm not too sure many of us were very aware of until we read the Tamworth Herald, which I'm sure you remember. One was anchor side, the fact that it's been bought, and it looks like it could well be um, heading for a change of use. Um, we can possibly see that coming down the line. The other one that no one seemed to know about was the library and the, the fact that that's decamping now to the youth centre. Um, I don't think anybody knew, even the county councillors didn't know until uh, they read it in the Herald. Um, we should presumably know about these things. Why don't we? And when will we find some details about them? Well, Thanks. I guess, one, it's a county council responsibility, the library point of view, so it's slightly out of the remit of this this committee. Um, and from a, a communication point of view, I guess that's, in some respects, that's outside the remit of this committee as well. Um, but absolutely take, take your point that, uh, yeah, there perhaps needs to be some better communication in some areas. I would have thought that it was extremely um, desirable and a matter of courtesy for the county council to have told us and informed us what their plans were. Um, I can't believe that they're just going ahead with something in our town without informing us about it. Sure. Chair, whilst I take the points about communication and agree with them, um, and also the point that the library is a county council matter and it's one that we can't have a great deal of input in. I think Ankerside is a different kettle of fish and uh, you know, we are the, the landlords. Um, so I think that is something that we should be considering because we've spent a lot of time on the Future High Street Fund, but actually Ankerside's a big part of the town centre. Um, and so the strategic direction of that should be important to us, even if we have little control over it. Thank, thanks, Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, anchor size does, does change um, ownership on a reasonably frequent basis um, from from a, from a from a high level point of view. As far as any um, change of change of use is con is concerned, then. Uh, yeah, I mean we can we can add it to our we can add it to our agenda to our work plan for sure. Um, I just I'll let you come back, Sheree. Sorry, back. just quickly. Um, when you say it's change of ownership, it's ownership of the lease. It's not ownership yeah. of the free. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would have thought that the lease must have a uh, prohibition against assignment without landlord's consent. So if the previous tenants decided to assign then we must have given consent um, and surely that sort of thing should be something that should be subject to scrutiny uh, in some part of the council it's uh, yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a valid point I think um, and we can add it onto the work plan the work plan is is the ownership of, of, of this committee so that that for, for sure Paul Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. I think there's a lot of, being a new kid on the block, there's a lot of infrastructure that's owned by, or the assets, should I say, that's owned 
by external bodies, whether that be county council or individuals or companies or whatever. And I think that part of the infrastructure committee remit should be that we should be aware of the changes and we should have a, a, perhaps an overview of where county are going and we should have the facility to call them to this meeting and say, look, you know, we're making plans or we, we've got a strategy for Tamworth. What's your strategy going forward? What, your assets, how are you going to manage them? Or are you not going to manage them? You may not know the answers. You may, but we need a, a bit of a, a heads up, if you like. Having no plan is not good. And you're right, for, for anchor side, my concern more than anything on a strategic point of view, uh, as what are our legal responsibilities as landlord, we know the building is, is, is not the best order uh, and the responsibility will fall on our shoulders at some point. I am extremely concerned that it's changed hand and I know that we say it happens frequently, but we get a very large percentage of our revenue, 1.1 million pound from that. Due to the condition of that building, the new landlord will be more focused on reducing their liabilities going forward. And if the concrete cancer and the deterioration of that uh, estate, building estate, continues, what do we do? So I think that we, we, we have it, owe it to ourselves as an infrastructure committee to actually get to the new owners, to call them to this committee, just to give us an overview and a bit of reassurance, what are you going to do with it? Okay. Yeah. And we can make plans then if the revenue stops coming in or they hand the lease back to us or whatever strategy they choose, if they change ownership, we, we can be a bit more ahead of the game and be proactive rather than reactive. So I'd like to put that forward, that we okay. put that on our work plan. We can, we can add that to, to the work plan for, for sure. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Thanks. I, I completely agree in terms of the um, change of lease with Ankerside inviting the new owners to come in and actually tell us what their plans are. Now, obviously, I wasn't aware. I knew that the lease had changed hands. I certainly wasn't aware of any change of use, I suppose. Um, um, not being part of the controlling group anymore, you don't get those early insights. Um, but no joke, I'm not, joking, I'm not being political. I'm just saying that it's true. Things tend to come to the controlling group first. I think also, though, if that is something that is a potential, we have to be careful as a committee that we're potentially not talking about people's jobs and livelihoods if that and actually i think we just need to kind of be mindful of that but also as well apart from the local plan document that has just been discussed the primary proposed shopping area incorporates anchor side as a major part of that and if there is a not just speculation and actual potential proposal coming forward it's slightly remiss that the cabinet member didn't tell us about that as part of this. I'm not saying he was withholding information, but I just think it's something that we need to be, we need to be up to date in terms of the information that we're making decisions upon. So again, I wasn't part of those conversations. I'm just making a comment on what Councillor Harper's just said. However, if that is an issue, then we should be told about it as a committee. If it's just a proposal, then let's actually hear what, what's going on. But just be mindful that quite a few people rely on it as a regular source of their salaries every month. Thanks, Michelle. Andy. Thanks, Chair. I think this um, leads into a bit of a, a, a larger issue for me. Um, it, it's something that I've raised a few times at Audit and Governance, um, and, the, and the Chair of Audit and Governance is in support of me. I think if we take a step back, uh, the, the Ang side issue is, is, is an issue. However, I think if we take a step back, um, I think there is an overriding issue over asset management an individual asset management plans based on the assets need and requirements. And I think that I have pushed it through audit and governance, so something more will be coming. But I definitely think that that, that work plan has to grace this committee is, is um, certainly with the, the, the larger assets that, uh, that fall under TBC is that when, when we're building asset management plans, part of that asset management plan is to look at leases and things like that and concrete cancer and you know problems with with, with who's looking after what uh, and uh, for me I think that that does lead into the bigger issue of the of the, of, of how we manage our assets and, and having individual plans for for each asset not not a spreadsheet that says X y and Z actually a, a, a written down document 
that is, is agreed upon by all uh, officers and councillors alike that says th these are our assets and these assets require these individual needs. Thanks, Andy. And yeah, I think I think that wider aspect does fall under, I think, corporate scrutiny. Actually, I think it's on. I think I think asset management strategy is is under corporate. And again, that is maybe something I need to take up with the chair of corporate scrutiny. Yeah, as chairs of audit and governance, I am looking into how are we governing our assets. How are we auditing them? Mm. I mean, I see lots of assets that have been left for many, many years that I, I, I think is fundamentally wrong, and we own them assets and we shouldn't. You know, if it was a private landlord, we would not be liking what they do and just left with not, you know, whether they've got the resources, whether we've got the plan. There's lots of questions that we just need to review. And if we don't have a plan, let's put a plan in place. And if we do have a plan, is it relevant and is it accurate? And who's, who's responsible for why, what and when? So I think it is time, and, and, and it is a big wakening up that, you know, even the assets I see, for example, you know, the, the George Bryan Centre, we've been on the eight ball again, we didn't know what the health authority were doing as an infrastructure committee, we, whether we can influence it, we should know, we should be prepared, and we should ask these awkward questions of, well, what are you doing with it? It was burnt down, did you have the insurance? Are you going to rebuild it? Are you not going to rebuild it? What time scale's going on? And I know that COVID's happened, but I see a lot of, in, in industry at the moment, there is a heck of a lot of apathy, there's a lot of assumptions, and there's a lack of leadership. And I think that, you know, we've got some really good committees and some really good chairs to actually move this forward now and take it by the scruff of the neck and say, right, what are the questions we need to look at? What do we need to review? Well, well, I would, I would, thanks Paul. I would suggest that, I was, again, I speak with the, with the chair of corporate because I think, I think it falls under corporate scrutiny. You mentioned the George Bryant Centre, which, which does fall under health and wellbeing. So we just, we need to be um, working a little bit better together as a, as a scrutiny uh, team it may be that the individual building has to be looked at by several committees or we do it holistically in the in the whole and and make a plan but making sure that we pick it up and not fall through the cracks has got to be the best way forward thanks th th thanks sure yeah and i endorse everything that's just been said and add to that decision-making processes. I would like to know what's delegated to officers, what goes through the relevant cabinet member and how those decisions are being made. I think that's really important. Andy. Yeah, it's something I raised that the last audit and governance committee, Sheree, um, we've, we've gone through a big thing at Network Rail at the moment called GRAY, which is Governance, Risk, Assurance and Improvement. And that did just that, but across nationally, across the whole uh, um, industry is who does what, who's accountable for what, and how do we assure that? And I, and I have been a, a big pusher of, of that and raised it at Audit and Governance, the last one, as an action to do just that here. We, we dig out all our processes, what we do, how we do it, we agree, and then we start to look at who does what, who's accountable for what, and who, who assures what. That, Andy, that's, that's great. And it, it, you, you, you're spot on. It is an it's, a, it's the job for audit and governance to, to do that. Um, you're, you're the same, ex excellent. Needed. Excellent. Um, okay, if there's no other comments on, on work plan, then I'm going to close the meeting at um, 8 o'clock dead, I think. So thanks very much for your, uh, your attendance. Thank you very much all.